going to our evening service. We'd ask if you have a church hymnal with you, please turn to hymn 231. If you have another media source, be singing tonight, Wonderful Words of Life. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, beginning in 101, I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Amen. And as we're preaching through the book of Acts on Sunday evenings, take your Bibles open to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, I uh, just want to pick up and read just a few verses here uh, to begin with, and then we'll come back and just walk through uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, how we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the privilege that we have of being here in this church building tonight, of preaching your word, and we just pray for those who are watching that, God, your word would go forth, and that it would instruct them as it does us. Uh, we pray that we be challenged, that we be drawn closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We also ask, Heavenly Father, if there are any who are not saved, may this be the day of salvation for them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 4, again, of the book of Acts. Acts is an exciting book. It unfolds the things that are happening with this new church. Uh, Jesus has died. He has paid our sin debt on Calvary. Now the church has begun. And with this new beginning, listen, the law has ended. Grace is now taking its place. The law, which must be obeyed, has now been set aside because Jesus fulfilled the law. No one else could have ever fulfilled the whole law. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law to pay our sin debt. 
So now we've entered into the age of grace or the church age. And again, this idea, this wonderful grace of God, unmerited favor. God loves me. And with that reality, we move in to the book of Acts. As is being unfolded, what happened? What took place? How did this happen? Was it without controversy? And of course, we see immediately in the book of Acts, it was much controversy. And we're going to also see that here in chapter 4. And so let's go back, pick up with verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple. Now, one of the things you need to point out immediately, they're speaking at the temple. And so the priests are there, the temple guard is there, the, he, they're speaking at the temple. And so they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. So here they are, and they are speaking, which we will see quite quickly, to a huge crowd, thousands of people. And they are listening intently. This, of course, upsets those at the temple. Verse 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This was the big thing here with the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed, believed in a resurrection after death. Not through Christ, but they believed in a resurrection after death. The Sadducees did not. And so that's where we see here, as it talks about the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, came upon them. And it grieved them, especially the Sadducees, because they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, say, well, what did this do? How did, how did this reach out and claim their attention? Well, their attention is, number one, if you believe in the Sadducees, there is no resurrection. Um, here, Jesus comes along. The Messiah of Israel, the people who listen to him and believe, are born again. They have received Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel. He speaks truth. And so here this one, Jesus Christ, and now his apostles and disciples, they are preaching the resurrection from the dead. If you remember, Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, risen again, and then for 40 days after his resurrection, he walked among the people. Hundreds, if not thousands of people saw him after his death. And so this is huge, this tremendous miracle. And now his disciples, the apostles, they are going forth and they are not just preaching, Jesus rose from the dead. They are preaching, we're going to rise from the dead. And if you believe on Jesus Christ, if, you're, if you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you too will be resurrected after death. This is huge. And this is what the Sadducees do not want preached. They do not want the people to hear this because they are coming to Christ. And again, we're going to see here in just a, just a minute. They're coming to Christ by the thousands. And, and they want to head this off. They want to stop this. And so, as that first verse told us, they came and took them. They not only took them, they took them right in the middle of preaching a message. They stopped it. And they come and they took them. Being grieved that they taught the people, preached through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. They laid hands on them and put them in hold. The word hold there uh, is, is the idea of they put them in prison. They put them in hold. The hold was the place where if someone was arrested, they would put them, they would put them in hold. We're going to hold on to these guys for a few days. So they're going to put them in a cell, they're going to close the door, they're going to lock it. We have them in hold. And so that's the idea. They laid hands on them, put them in hold under the next day, for it was now eventide, which means it was evening, it was getting late. Howbeit. Many of them which heard the word believed, even though they stopped the preaching before they were through, many of them had already heard the gospel. And of these who heard the gospel, uh, as it tells us, be many of them heard the word believed. The number of the men was about 5,000. Now, my friends, there was more there than just men. But here, the number of men who believe is 5,000. 
And it came to pass on the morrow, or the next day, that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas and Annas and the, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, all well-known men uh, involved in, again, in Judaism, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest. So, hey, all of his relatives, whoever was kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have he done this? They bring them from the hold. They bring them in the middle of all of these people that they have brought together, and they ask them the question. They had put them together. By what power or by what name have ye done this? Well, I want to tell you what. That's the exact question they wanted to hear. And that should be the question we want to hear. When we are witnessing to somebody, or we somebody knows that we're a Christian, and as we begin to witness to them, talk to them, uh, well, that's what I want to hear. I want somebody to ask me, why do you believe this? What, what name uh, you know, do you ascribe to this relationship? Well, that opens the door for a tremendous testimony. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you what, when you start witnessing to somebody, that's the best way to be is filled with the Holy Ghost. He said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, what started all of this? And Peter points this out immediately. You know, they want to come at this that they're breaking the law. They're breaking with tradition. They're breaking with the teaching of the Sadducees. Well, whatever they're trying to make this, Peter takes it right back to what started this. Why are we being questioned? Why were hands put on us in the first place? And so, again, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he was made whole? The miracle of healing of the impotent man. He puts his finger, that's why we're here. We're not here because of breaking laws, we're not here because we offended the Sadducees, the Pharisees don't believe, or the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, those guys get along all the time, we're not here for any of those things. We're here because of the healing of the impotent man. Uh, verse 10, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. He said, look, this is not a Peter and John. This is not by any power that we personally have. This is of Jesus Christ. This is of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And again, once he goes right to the, to the point again, whom you crucified. This one who himself healed the sick raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, did all of those things, went about doing good, is what the Bible tells us of Christ, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This resurrection, whom they had all heard of, although they chose to deny, the reality is they all knew of the resurrection. They all heard of the resurrection. They had all heard testimonies of hundreds if not thousands of people that were out there testifying to have seen Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead, even by him, Jesus Christ. Does this man stand here before you whole? One of the interesting things is, if you pick it up in this verse, he's standing there with them, beside them, and he's cured. He's whole. This man. Oh, they, they can't deny. What are they going to say? And if we go, just let's quickly, let me see. Um, I'm not seeing it yet, but uh, as we get along here, the one verse tells us that this man was over 40 years old. This isn't a kid. This isn't somebody who had you know, just been there a few days or, or that hardly anybody had seen 
This is the one that had been brought to the gate, sat there day after day after day, and he was over 40 years old. And so this is undeniable, the reality, the truth of what they had done in raising this impotent man. Remember, he walked, he, he leaped, he praised God. He was running around. I mean, this was a wonderful miracle. This is the, and, and he goes on here, he says, from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. He's complete now. This is the stone, continue to refer to Jesus Christ. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. God wanted Israel to continue to build religiously through their Messiah, Jesus Christ, whom God sent to them. And so they sent Jesus Christ, the stone which was set at naught, considered nothing by them, set at naught of you builders, you religious Israel, you were to build, you were to continue building the God-given truth of the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. It was given to you to present Jesus Christ in salvation to the entire world. You set it at naught. You counted it as nothing at all. Set at naught, you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Okay, Israel, the law is being set aside. Jesus Christ is becoming, as this tells us here, uh, he is the one who has become the head of the corner of the church. The truth had been given to Israel. Israel denied the, the truth. We find out later, in scripture, and then that truth was what? Given to the Gentiles. The Gentiles received it. The Gentiles moved it on. Although first, and we are what we're looking at here is the fact that it went to the Jew first. Salvation in Jesus Christ was to the Jew first, then the Gentile. But the reality here, these are Jews, again, listen, Peter and John, we're talking about Jews here, trying to get religious Israel to open their eyes and see their Messiah. Neither is there salvation, he goes on in verse 12, in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You crucified him. He was sent by God. You set this one at naught, counted him as nothing. And so now, what? He has come to all who will believe. And he brings salvation, and that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. They wanted, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and others, they wanted salvation to be seen as coming through them. The only way to God was through them. Same story as so many cults today. If you ever start talking to somebody, and they're in a religious group, and that group begins to tell you, and or as you listen to them, that their way is the only way to heaven. There's no other way that you can get to heaven. It's only through us. We have the secret. Listen, you need to discount them because whosoever will may come. There is no group, again, who has, again, the, the choke hold, if you will, on the truth. And so here, the Jews could have had this. This could have been theirs, but they rejected Jesus Christ, whereby... It is in Christ, he says, whereby ye must be saved. So Peter now points right back to these Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, the scribes, everybody else who was there. He says, there's only one way to heaven. Only one. And that's Jesus Christ. My friends, it's still the same today. There's only one way to heaven. And that's Jesus Christ. I have heard men, theologians supposedly, who look at all the different world religions and they come and say well you know they all believe in a higher power they all believe in a god and and so we believe from that that you know we're, we're arguing and we're fighting about who's god who's not god who's in trouble we really believe that when you get to the top of the mountain we'll find out it's all the same god no just as there is only one christ and one way to salvation there's also only one god 
And this idea of multiple gods, which many religions believe that there are multiple gods, that doesn't exist. But here with Jesus Christ, there is only one way that we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, the first read in the way we look at things, we say, wow, they were, they were ignorant men. Uh, they were unlearned men. I mean, they, they, they couldn't talk right. I mean, they were just kind of stupid. Or what this, no, what they marveled at, these men had not gone to our schools. These men had not graduated from our seminaries. These men had not been accepted among us as scholars. But listen to them. Listen to what they're saying. It says they marveled at what they were saying. They marvel at their ability to communicate. They shouldn't be able to communicate this way. They were never trained, and in their eyes, they're unlearned, ignorant men. But listen to them. And they marvel, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. How do these guys get so smart? How can they communicate this way? They took note. These men had been with Jesus. Listen, we need to take note. As we read the word of God, those who wrote the Bible, they were men who were with God. They were men who were with Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against him. Here's the man they healed. Standing with them, what are they going to say? <clears throat> the guy's over 40 years old. Everybody in Jerusalem who went to the temple, which is where he sat at the gate, uh, beautiful. He's sitting there. Everybody walked by him. Everybody saw him. Everybody knew him. How are they going to deny this miracle? <clears throat> Excuse me. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. They took them then, and they set them outside of the council. Remember all the people that had gathered? Set them outside of the council and commanded them to do that. And they conferred among themselves. What are we going to do with these guys? Verse 16. Saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest. Manifest means clearly seen. This miracle is clearly seen to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. Wow. And we cannot deny it. Been there, over 40 years old, sitting at the temple. Everybody that went to the temple saw this guy. All Jerusalem knew this man had been healed. We cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth no more, no to no man in this name. Don't you speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Listen, why? Well, we don't want to spread any further. But have they not been noticing what's going on? 3,000 people had already been saved. Now 5,000 more men had been saved. They think this is going to go anywhere. But again, we need to stop this. We need to nip it in the bud. But that spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth from now on to no man in this name. And they called them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them. And, and again, I'll tell you what, when we are told uh, to shut up, when we are told, no, don't, don't, don't you preach to us? And again, we need to be very careful as to how we do this. We don't want to just outright offend people. But the reality is here, they are told, they are instructed to preach no more in this name. And it said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than to God, judge ye. These are the men who are, in fact, the judges of Israel. These are the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. These are the who sit on the council. 
These are the men who listen to these things. They make these judgments. And Peter and John say, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than unto God, judge ye. Listen, are you, you need to think this over. Should we listen to you as the judge? Or should we listen to God? Your authorities, you judge. Which should we do? And it's very interesting after they challenge them to that, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We can't stop testifying about the truth. We, we can't. And we're not going to stop testifying about the truth. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. Where they looked at the crowds, they looked at the people, they saw what was going on, and they're glorifying God. That is where religious Israel, that's where the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, were to be bringing Israel to glorifying and honoring God. And they hadn't done that. Not even close. And here comes these ignorant, unlearned men start preaching Jesus Christ and, and him resurrected from the dead and his payment of their sin debt guaranteeing them resurrection also. These men come speaking the truth. They don't know how to handle it. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Going back to the healing of the lame man. Verse 22. For the man was above 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing was shown. And being let go, they went to their own company, reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. Now all of their friends, all the people that, that, that they had been with, uh, they had been shut out. They couldn't be in this council meeting. So now they leave the council meeting when they're finally let go, and they go back as it tells us here, to their own company, reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of the servant David has said, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. God, all of these things have already happened. As he has walked down and rehearsed again how these things have been done, how they have been mistreated. Jesus was mistreated. Look what Pilate did. Look what Herod did. Walking down through all the horrible things that had already taken place. And so then they ask uh, uh, here, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Here we go again. We're being threatened. We're told not to preach in his name. And grant unto thy servants that with boldness they may speak thy word. They will not be quieted. They will not be contained. They are going to continue to preach the truth of the word of Jesus Christ by stretching forth thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Just as they had healed the lame man by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, now listen, this is the whole group. This is John, Peter and John's company. This is that, those people, their group. 
And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They spake the word of God with boldness. So not just Peter and John, but all the company now begins to speak the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they all had, they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Wow, the unmerited favor of God. The windows of heaven simply opened. And they were given this great ability to preach the word of God, to preach the resurrection from the dead through Jesus Christ. And they, as that entire company, were filled and going and ready. Neither was there any among them that laughed, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. We have thousands of people now who have been saved and they have needs and, and, and they're, what, what are they doing? Boy, they're going about preaching Jesus Christ. They have great boldness to preach the truth of the resurrection through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Sounds to me like it means they're not working and they're preaching. They're not farming the farms. They're not doing those things. And so they have need. And when those needs arise, say, hey, I've got a piece of property I can sell. Hey, I have, I have food that I can bring. Hey, and all of a sudden, all the believers come together and have all things common. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite out of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Listen, there was nothing precious to them anymore. Nothing of this world was precious. The only thing precious to them was their relationship with Jesus Christ and the souls of men that they might reach out for every man as a soul for whom Christ died. And it seems that by this infilling of the Holy Spirit, that true reality of everyone around them was a soul for whom Christ died. And they were moved by that Holy Spirit to witness, to confront, to try to draw them, lead them to Jesus Christ, telling them the truth of the virgin birth all the way through to the crucifixion the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Jesus Christ, and all that had been done by Christ as the miraculous and through the apostles and the others as God gave them abilities of miraculous. This was given to authenticate the truth of the coming of the Holy Spirit of God in power and in might. This was going to be taken away. This was to authenticate that the church might grow on solid ground, that people might recognize this as coming from God. It could come from nowhere else. And so the reality, again, of this wonder of the glory of God, worked through his son, Jesus Christ, brought to man by the indwelling Holy Spirit of God and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God, drawing men to salvation. All of these things we are being taught, we are being shown here in the book of Acts. We can back up by walking through this 2,000 years and know exactly what happened. Know what happened with Peter and John. Follow things along historically. God has done a wonderful thing for us in the book of Acts. We will continue. We'll pick up at chapter 5 next week and just continue on as we preach through the book of Acts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, how we thank you tonight for your wondrous love for us. God, you are just as concerned with the souls of men right now as you were 2,000 years ago. God, you are just as concerned, and you want men, women, boys, and girls to come to Jesus Christ 
You want them to hear the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God that tells them, that convinces them that this is the truth. And that this being the truth, they set aside their sin. They set aside their prejudices. They set aside everything that would keep between them and God. And they come to that place. And they say, yes, God, I need a Savior. I need Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. And without Jesus Christ, I'm on my way to hell. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for sending us a Savior. Thank you for sending Christ. Thank you for showing us this first century church, this wonder as we walk through the book of Acts. And God, I can get saved the same way. All I need to do is confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. I shall be saved. As we believe the miraculous of Jesus Christ, as we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, as we repent of our sin, means change my mind about sin. Heavenly Father, God, you save us. We look to you. We thank you. We turn these things over to you. In Jesus' name.